How do psychologists obtain their knowledge? Magazines, internet, secondhand sources. Hopefully you were not tempted by those answers. See if you can decide where we do get our knowledge, and then we'll see you on the next slide. How do psychologists obtain their knowledge? Magazines, internet, secondhand sources. Hopefully you were not tempted by those answers. See if you can decide where we do get our knowledge, and then we'll see you on the next slide. Take a moment and see if you can remember the basic steps of the scientific method. So for our first step, we have developed a hypothesis. The asterisk means I'm going to have some cautions for you in the next slide based on common mistakes I see students make on tests. You cannot put the word hypothesis. It's a lazy answer. It's not a complete concept. So develop a hypothesis is a good answer, though you do not have to say develop a hypothesis for me. You could say, well, think of some different ways of saying develop a hypothesis, and I'll pause for a moment. Create a hypothesis, good. State a hypothesis, excellent. Formulate a hypothesis, you get the idea. So on the test, uh, definitely tell me a phrase involving a hypothesis. You also need to know this hypothesis needs to be a statement, not a question. You'll see that on the next slide. And also, it must be specific. It's not sufficient to say that one variable affects another. How does it affect it? It makes it quicker, slower, bigger, smaller, and so on. So again, it needs to be a specific prediction. For step two, you could put test hypothesis. That's a logical follow-up. Conversely, it's also very good to put gather data. Either one is good, but don't put both on a test. If you double list a step, it makes me think that you're confused. So choose one or the other, whichever you prefer. I've listed for you some of the different ways of testing the hypothesis. Observational research, case study, survey, correlational study, experiment. So we have many options, including these, and it is some additional ones as well. The next step, you'll create a mountain of data. The next step would be analyze the data. Do you have to use the word analyze? No, you could interpret it. You can apply statistics to it. But you get the idea. More than just one word. Last step, and a lot of students stop there, and unfortunately they can't get full credit. The last step is to publish the results. Can you share that differently? Absolutely. Share the results is also very good. So absolutely positively make sure that you can easily list the four steps of the scientific method. Let's see how well you're doing on this hypothesis topic. Read the slide and note these three examples. Are they all good hypotheses? None of them, some of them. So identify the true hypothesis or hypotheses. Our first example has a question, not a statement, so that is not a hypothesis. I often see questions on tests. The next one is prediction, statement, specific. It is an excellent hypothesis, and we can test it. The third one, much too vague, so it would not be a good or testable hypothesis. On this slide, we see many of the major research methods used in psychological research. Slides like this where you have a heading and a, a list of items are great study tools. After you've gone through the material and you feel reasonably comfortable with it, go ahead and just cover up each item and see how many of them that you can remember by name. And if there's anything below the title, see if you can recall that. It gives you great feedback in terms of what you know and what you don't know. On the subsequent slides, we'll be looking at each of these individual research methods, so let's jump into the next slides. So some of the more famous case studies in abnormal psychology would be related to multiple personality disorder. Were you able to think of any? Uh, probably the most famous one would be Sybil, 
uh, both in a book and a movie. I remember reading the books undergraduate. I was very fascinated. Another major one that was released after that would be called The Three Faces of Eve. I assume you can guess how many personalities she had. I also read that as an undergraduate. Other famous case studies. Did you come up with any possibilities? Sometimes students will say uh, the Little Albert study. Uh, no, that was uh, an experiment. Other will say Ivan Pavlov's work. No, that was also an experiment. You might recognize in the bottom uh, the, uh, the picture of Phineas Gage. And maybe your teacher in intro psych uh, discussed uh, Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Not all teachers do, but I like to mention the intro psych, so perhaps you're familiarized with that one. In my very first semester of the college, I ordered that for the library, and that was well over 20 years ago. The next research method that we'll consider will be the case study. We'll define it as an intensive investigation of a rare phenomenon in a person. If you don't like the word phenomenon, just substitute the word thing. So we would resume this for uh, situations where we have one individual, so we can't use most of the other research methods. Take a moment and look at the other two captions and see if you can make any guesses and then return to the next narration. So some of the more famous case studies in abnormal psychology would be related to multiple personality disorder. Were you able to think of any? Uh, probably the most famous one would be Sybil, uh, both in a book and a movie. I remember reading the books undergraduate. I was very fascinated. Another major one that was released after that would be called The Three Faces of Eve. I assume you can guess how many personalities she had. I also read that as an undergraduate. Other famous case studies. Did you come up with any possibilities? Sometimes students will say uh, the Little Albert study. Uh, no, that was uh, an experiment. Other will say Ivan Pavlov's work. No, that was also an experiment. You might recognize in the bottom uh, the, uh, the picture of Phineas Gage. And maybe your teacher in intro psych uh, discussed uh, Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Not all teachers do. But I like to mention the intro psych, so perhaps you're familiarized with that one. In my very first semester of the college, I ordered that for the library, and that was well over 20 years ago. The survey methods aren't a commonly used research method for abnormal psychology. They include questionnaires and interviews. In some ways, if you think of it, a questionnaire is rather like a written interview, in some ways an interview is like a spoken questionnaire. Now the survey methods, uh, questionnaires and interviews that is, are frequently used on a one-to-one -one basis to learn information about your client or if you have a psychodynamic perspective, your patient. An example would be the skit. See if you can remember what each letter stands for and if you can't, well, that's fine. Try to guess if you, and we'll see how you do on the next uh, microphone. Well, I assume even if you couldn't remember the skid, you'd correctly guess the I as being an interview. The S would be structured, C would be clinical, and D would be the D of our DSM. So structured clinical interview of the DSM, which is one of the gold, inter, uh, gold standards for interview uh, formats and choices. Let's now consider the longitudinal study. Perhaps you covered an intro psych or not. Either way is fine. In this research design, you follow the same group of stub subjects for an extended period of time, hence the term longitudinal. Uh, how long is longitudinal? Well, definitely way over six months, uh, definitely over a year, uh, definitely over two years. So extended time period might be five years, 10 years, or in some exceptional ones, decades. When these decade studies come out, they're very exciting. Uh, they're published in the uh, most prestigious journals of science, 
and a lot of times they get in the evening news and a newspaper on the radio they really are hard to do because you have to follow these same group of people and that takes time that takes money uh, but they again uh, yield exceptional data so again as we've learned positive and negative have nothing to do with good or bad it has to do with our data so in the first example if we graph the data and saw this pattern that would indicate there's a positive correlation between those two variables as one goes up the other gets up and if one's a smaller in one it will be tend to be smaller on the other b is a negative correlation so if one variable is high the other one tends to be very low or if you're looking at a very low one its corresponding data point would be very high so you can see the pattern of data points for a negative correlation for the third example they chose height and gpa no predictable relationship knowing one does not help you predict the other one whatsoever with any degree of accuracy and you'd see a pattern that's just random and thus you could not draw that line to best fit which you can easily do with a positive or negative correlation let's do a couple more examples because i assume that you're still learning the concepts and that's fine let's now consider a study called the correlational study its purpose prediction when we want to be able to predict one variable from another there are three types of correlations that might come out if we did correlation research a positive correlation a negative correlation or a zero correlation let's now consider the experiment we're really not supposed to have a favorite research method like people are not supposed to have a favorite child but in this case I think it's okay this is our favorite research method because it is the only research method note the caps meaning it's highly important it's the only research method which allows us to draw cause and effect conclusions to say this thing causes the other to happen in a correlational study you can do prediction but you can't conclude that one variable is causing another let's consider example let's say that I'm hired by a business to correlate two interesting variables ice cream sales for every day in a year and deaths by drowning and I find that there is a predictable correlation on days where there's lots of ice cream sales there tends to be more drowning on days with very few ice cream sales there tends to be less drowning are you willing to say that when people drown people go out and have ice cream parties I hope not if you eat ice cream you're likely to flop around the floor and drown obviously not so you can see that one can be predicted from the other but what is causing the relationship it's a third variable if that's a hint so on days with high ice cream sales it's harder when it's hotter more people tend to swim and not everybody swims as well as everybody else so we have a higher rate of drowning on cold days people are less inclined to eat ice cream and people are less inclined to swim and therefore not risking drowning is greater frequency so clearly it's the temperature which is causing the relationship not the variables directly influence each other so the point is that even if there's a predictable correlation positive or negative you cannot assume that the variables cause the change in the other one maybe they did maybe they didn't the correlational study has no way of determining that information if you want to do cause and effect you better do an experiment let's now consider the experiment the experiment may or may not use deception many students uh, primarily in intro psych I hope are surprised that psychologists can still use deception in an experiment consider the placebo pill isn't that deception experiments will have two variables and two groups uh, take a moment and see if you can remember their names and then proceed to the next slides so let's look at the basic components of experiment those elements which eventually allow the cause and effect conclusion to occur two types of variables two types of groups take a moment and see if you can identify both the groups and the variables so let's look at the basic components of experiment those elements which eventually allow the cause and effect conclusion to occur two types of variables two types of groups 
take a moment and see if you can identify both the groups and the variables. So now let's learn our terminology, which is specific to the experiment, starting with variables. The independent variable, IV if you want to abbreviate it, is the treatment. Next time you get a prescription, if it's a paper one, look at it and you'll see an RX. That's the abbreviation for treatment. So it might be medication. It might be a new study technique. It might be a new form of exercise. So it's a treatment. And we'll learn that half the subjects will get it and half will not. But in case, the independent variable is the treatment. The dependent variable is the measured outcome. As a mnemonic, which might help you out so you don't confuse the two, the outcome is dependent. The outcome is dependent on everything that goes on in the study, which group you're in, if you get the treatment or not, if the treatment works. So the outcome is dependent, so it is called the dependent variable. Now a caution here, on your first test you'll probably have two different hypotheses, and for each one you'll have to also design an experiment indicating the variables and the groups. When you choose your dependent variable, don't confuse it with the results of the study that you run. For example, if you we were going to look at maybe the effects of exercise on weight, for the dependent variable, it would be weight. You wouldn't put weight loss because you don't know until you run the study if there will be weight loss. You choose a dependent variable before the study is run. If you're looking at insomnia, your dependent wouldn't be a reduction in insomnia. The dependent variable would just be a quality of sleep. So again, dependent variable is the outcome, and we establish the outcome we'll measure before we run the study. And if I lost you there, it's okay. We're going to practice it on the next couple slides. Before we're ready to apply our terms, we have learned the other set of terms, the groups. Experimental group. There's the subjects who get the treatment, whatever that treatment might be. It might be medication. It might be a new study technique. It might be exercise. You get the idea. It's a treatment. So if they're getting the treatment, they are the experimental group. The control group, well, they would be the subjects who do not get the treatment. They're treated like in every other way. So if the experimental group gets a pill, the control group gets a placebo pill, and so on. So we need the control group for a comparison. What would happen if the people didn't, or the animals didn't get the treatment? So in psychology, there's haves and have-nots. Sometimes it's better to be in the have-not group, or sometimes it's better to be in the have group. But now let's apply this and see how we do. Let's now consider a design called the AB AB design, or sometimes the reversal design. It's an experiment done with one subject. How can you do this? Well, in the A phase, we'll just observe our subject and there is no treatment given. This will, cons this will constitute basically uh, a certain group. See if you can remember your terminology from intro psych. In the next phase, uh, our subject will be given a treatment, and in this way, our subject now serves as the other group associated with the experiment. Uh, consider those terms for a moment and see which you think might go in which blank. So in phase A, it's rather analogous to a control group. In phase B, serves the same function as the experimental group. In phase A, the treatment is now removed. And in phase B, the treatment is added in again. So let me give you an example. Let's say that a uh, teacher of kindergarten has an aggressive child that attacks the other children. And she's focused, or he is focused all her, his or her energy on the aggressive child. But let's say this, re this teacher has learned a better strategy. When the attacks occur, all the attention that used to be lavished on the aggressor will now be totally and exclusively focused on the victim. The aggressor is no longer given any attention. So in the A phase, we'll collect data in terms of our child's aggressive behavior. In the B phase, the treatment will be introduced. 
you would expect in the A phase, as you can see in the chart below, a market decrease in aggression. But is it due to that or something else going on in the child's life? We truly don't know because we only have one subject in each group, and that's the same subject. In the next A phase, the treatment will be removed. If our treatment had an effect, you should see a return to baseline behavior. In the B phase, where the treatment is added back in again, if the treatment was truly causing the results, you should see a return to the treatment condition behavior. So a very analogous experiment will design, very comparable to the real experiment that we're more often used to. And to answer the question posed on our slide, what was the independent and dependent variable in our example? Well, if the independent variable is the treatment, the treatment would be the attention the teacher lavished on the victim. The dependent variable, the thing that we suspect would depend on whether or not the individual got a treatment, the dependent variable would be the aggression rate of our child that we're trying to have an altered and better uh, plan for their behavior. Sometimes researchers want to discover the relative contributions of genes and environment to particular traits, such as mental illness. Now in the blanks, if you look at them, you might suspect one word would be nature and one word would be nurture. Uh, that would be correct, but take a moment and see if you can remember which term is which. Hopefully you want to put in the first blank for the words related to genes or genetic, nature, and the second blank related to environment, which is sometimes referred to as learning factors. Hopefully you want the word uh, nurture. There are three main studies that explore the nature versus nurture contribution to characteristics. One is the kinship, uh, sometimes called family study. This is when we just look to see if we can find family lines in which that generational trait runs in many, many generations of the family if it's being passed down. Other designs that are also genetic uh, related studies include the adoption study, which we try to determine if the child with a condition is more like the parents that gave the genes or the parents that gave the environment. The third type of study is twin study Comparing the, uh, the rate of the condition in identical versus fraternal twins, obviously the twin would be raised in the home with the other twin, so the environment is always held constant, but the genetics involved vary in terms of the genetic relatedness of the twin types. You may or may not remember or have covered in intro psych that identical twins share 100% of their genes in common, whereas fraternal twins, like any other set of siblings, share on average 50% of their genetic material in common. So this is used to calculate with complex statistics the relative contributions of genes and environment. Now that I've snuck in that little public service announcement, let's return to our task of the scientific method. Look at these three students, student A, student B, student C. Look at each answer and see if you think that would be acceptable or not for a test. Let's look at student A first. Step one, great. Step two, big problem, too specific. It leaves out many research methods. Three, fair enough. Four, also good. For student B, number one, much too lazy. What about the hypothesis? That would not receive credit. Two, fine. Three, fine. Four, also fine. Student C, one is good. Two is vague enough. It's also good. Three is good. And four is good. So make sure that you, if asked this question on a test, would be able to do it easily.